Jag tänkte bara eh, hälsa alla välkomna. Super, super kul att ni alla är här och fortsätter att vräka in folk. Som sagt, det är så roligt när det kommer också personer som är nya till det här projektet i de här mötena. Och det är liksom hela tjusningen med att köra öppna möten. Man vet aldrig riktigt vad som händer. Men det finns ju massor med möjligheter att hoppa på det här. Det är ju så vi vill ha det. Att alla som vill komma in och lära sig någonting gör det. Och hittar vi sen någonting som vi behöver göra mer av eller bygga på ytterligare projekt, hitta annan finansiering, vad det kan vara för samarbeten, affärer, så tar vi tur med det efteråt. Så att byta lite uppgifter i chatten och så här. Och vi som jobbar i projektet är förstås väldigt eh, nåbara under mötet och efter för specifika frågor. Den om vi inte hinner ta hand om det precis just nu. Eh, men vi sitter ju med en fast massa branscher i det här projektet. Vi har senast, igår hade vi en hel dag med planglas där Ragnsells och gänget hade en hel dags workshop kring spårbarhet i den branschen. Och här om veckan så hade vi Trust Trace och gänget som stod på mässa i Göteborg och visade på spårbarhet för textilier och för kläder kanske framförallt och samarbete med Kappal och Marineco till exempel. Jättefint. Och sen har vi livsmedel, vi har elektronik, elektroniska produkter och inte minst då digitala tvillingar i cirkulära värdnätverk. Så totalt är vi till en 60 parter i det här projektet. Byggindustrin ska jag nämna också, inte minst. Så den gemensamma nämnden här är ju spårbarhet och hur vi liksom kan jobba gemensamt om det här med och vilken sorts data behöver vi dela när vi tittar på de kommande produktplatsen för Europa. Och så. Och det var väl ungefär det tror jag som jag behöver säga. Eh, och vi tycker alla här tror jag att det, det finns liksom gott om anledning att jobba tillsammans över branschgränserna. Eh, som jag sa idag så fick jag en liten propå från Vinova. Vi tror att vi skulle behöva ett litet nätverk som lever ett lä- över längre tid för att prata om de här sakerna. Så där håller vi på att diskutera med finansiärerna, framförallt då Vinova och Energimyndigheten om hur de kan hjälpa oss att få till ett sånt här så att så många som möjligt Förstår så bra som möjligt innan produktpassar så till vad man behöver göra med sina produkter. Om det finns någon sorts kort checklista där. Sen kommer vi få en fantastisk genomgång av Sofie och hennes gäng i eh, Polis utbildningsprojektet. Mycket snygg vinkning där. Eh, på senare delen av mötet. När vi alla kommer få en, en genomgång tror jag av vad som finns där. Och sen så kan man ju gå igenom de utbildningsmodulerna med fördel efter mötet sen kanske. Om man vill liksom njuta av lite mer spårbarhetsövningar framåt kvällen så där. Men jag tror med det sagt, eh, jag kan också möjligen presentera, presentera mig igen. Jag heter Malin Roskvist, jag är projektledare för hela det här äventyret. Men de som gör, gör det största jobbet är förstås våra delprojektledare. Där vi ser några stycken i bild nu. Och de kommer att presentera i den här strömhoppsagendan som vi nu har framför oss. Så att i tur så kommer vi se Monica Odlare, sen Sofie Chapentier, vi kommer ha Karin Wannerberg, vi kommer ha Jenny Wern, Evelina eh, Lektesaro och... Uh, ungefär där går vi i mål med subprojekten och sen så har vi lite gästspelare och sen så är det detta med utbildningsdelarna och ett litet styrbesök från Vinova också mot slutet av mötet. Så jag tror vi kör igång där. Monica, är du redo? Mm, ja, men jag är redo. Monica Odler heter jag. Jag är professor i miljöteknik på Mälardalens högskola och jag är projektledare för ett av delprojekten under Trace for Values. Jag tänkte Lite kort berätta om det och vårt nya projekt som vi också har fått in. Så nu ska jag försöka hålla mig kort för jag tror det var bara 15 minuter. Va? Precis. Men nu pratar vi svenska Malin. Ska jag köra, ska jag köra på svenska eller engelska? Vad, är det någon som inte förstår svenska? Det blir konstigt att prata engelska om alla här från, är, talar svenska. Det är konstigt. Låt oss säga, vi kör svenska och för those English speaking in the audience, uh, please let us know in the chat if, in case you don't understand Swedish, if we need to switch to English. För att som ni ser så mina slides är på engelska, eh, så att jag hade tänkt köra på engelska, men nu insåg jag att du pratar i svenska. Men ja, men det här är i alla fall, det här är ett av delprojekten som heter Circularity for Nutrients and Food Production, så vi jobbar med näringsämnen och vattenåtervinning i våra projekt. Så jag tänkte lite kort berätta om det delprojektet för det kopplar även till ett nytt projekt som heter Unity for Water som vi har liksom byggt, vi har byggt ut och byggt vidare våra delprojekt här. Och det vi vill göra det är liksom att vi, vi vill vara lite pionjärer inom helhetstänket inom just forskningen som alltså handlar om resurshushållning mot en framtids, liksom en mer hållbar framtid. 
Så målbilden är att inget vatten i huvud taget någonsin ska ses som ett avfall. Och näringsämnen, kol och andra nyttiga ämnen som finns i vårt samhälle ska alltid återvinnas och återanvändas. Och allt vatten är ett vatten. Det är liksom det vi gör avstamp i i våra projekt. Så att det är liksom målbilden att i princip fånga upp allt vatten som kommer från avlåsredningsverk, processvatt och från industrin och annat. Och tillsammans med alla näringsämnen så använder vi det i en matproduktion. Monica, och så här, can ja. we switch to English? Yes, we switch to English. It, uh, <laughs> then, I then I don't have to translate these slides. So within this uh, trace for value and uh, unity for water that I'm going to tell a little bit more later, we have established um, research infrastructure now that we call Farm for Future. So I'm not going to go into depth about that, but as you can see, we we use we grow vegetables in a controlled environment where we circulate all the uh, nutrients and water. We're also about to add a little aquaponic system with fish tanks. And then we use we, we do research in optimization of this of light management on solar energy AIs. So we try to connect everything. And also one important thing here is that we would like to trace to show if somebody buy or eats uh, something that we grow, like you see in the right corner here, we would somehow like to label that so that it can be traced back to the amount of uh, reclaimed and reused water nutrients that we have in the system. So we are in this system, we're working with several partners and within several areas. So we really in a lot of companies that not all of these are directly involved, but somehow indirectly in the systems that we are building. So we also have, other than this, we have other connecting projects. We have one called Aqua to Farm and one called Carbon to Food and Future Proof Cities that we also, that we have connected to the Trace for Value where we look more specific at specific part of the research as in we use spectral imaging to detect the plants and the water. And we also, we capture carbon dioxide from the air. And then we try to see how we can integrate this in something in the, in a future-proof city where we want to build or contribute to the construction of sustainable urban development. So this is the Trace for Value, our sub-project. As you can see, we are focusing on using organic waste and wastewater. We transform it and we put it into a local vertical urban farm. And then we do research on how we can optimize this, how we can monitor so that make sure that we have that it's safe to eat, that we treat the water properly, and also how we can modify the light condition and the nutrient conditions and everything to get an optimized little urban farm. And this is what we are about to build now, a demonstration unit that we are Right now, this week, actually, we are cleaning the lab in order to install this together with one of our, our partner companies, Wegrim. So it's going to be a demonstration unit where we will produce 68 plants per day. So we have not quite figured out what we're going to do with all these plants since it's part of the research project, but we'll still produce a lot of plants. And in that, we will also integrate the carbon capture unit and a fertilization unit, and we will try to see how we can automate and use automation to, to drive this facility. So in the long term, it will look something like this. So we will show uh, visitors and we would like to invite people, visitors and politicians, students, anyone who's interested to come and see and see for themselves to kind of follow um, the the journey that the nutrient or the water is doing from where it's being produced, how we treat it and reclaim it, and then we use it into the urban farm. So all the way here to the left, you see like the baby nursery that we call where the baby plants are born or grown, we sow them, and then they grow and they get older through the system and then they're ready for the harvest. So then everyone will be able to see with their own eyes that it's possible to reclaim this um, elements from the society and we haven't quite built it yet so right now we're just testing the facility so we, we're building small farms in our lab and before we have built this real farm this is my PhD student Rayana. here we are growing basil and uh, some other plants uh, that are we can where we have tested different types of lights and as you can see it's they're really big and strong and healthy so so in order to 
we try to use light dynamic light system to change the wavelength of the light uh, depending on how big the plant is so that we will optimize the light conditions. And the extension of this is that we just recently, just before uh, Christmas in December, we got funding from PIA and through Venova and Formas Energy Mindigheten for a new project called Unity for Water, where we take this even one step further. So rather than just looking at nutrients and carbon and, and a few water sources, we actually look at uh, uh, we want to look at least all water sources in society and also involve the process industry for this. So we have a budget of about 30 million Swedish crowns with about 25 partners, where the goal is to create a value of wastewater. So these are our port partners right now. As you can see, we have PS, the funding source, and we have a steering group from PIA, Metalliska Resource, Swedish Mining and Bioinnovation. And then we have some companies that are involved. And we have some academic institutes and also two municipalities, one in West Westeros and also in City of Wichita Falls that we cooperate with. So in this, we are continuing to build an even bigger infrastructure. So we are also adding now we have spectral measurement that we use online monitoring to track the plants and see how they grow uh, in the water that we uh, use for irrigation. So we want to see how they react to water from different parts of society. We will install an electronic nose system and also continue to capture the carbon dioxide. We're working a lot of dynamic light systems to make sure that the light that we use the correct light, depending on what the crop needs, and also kind of advanced uh, irrigation and fertilization system. So through all this, we hope that we will be able to collect a lot of data that we then can communicate back to the plant uh, or the facilities so that we can uh, so that we can save energy and get the most out of everything that's the plan. So this is what we have so far. So we are working like in temporary conditions right now until we build the large plant. So here we are testing different water. So we add the water manually now in different in containers, and then we use it to irrigate the plants and we see, and then we monitor the plants and we analyze them. So this is a, a big picture of how we now expand the trace of value into include much more um, uh, much more thorough investigation now of different water coming in. And also we have a plan for how to use the waste that coming from the, uh, the facility because we will produce maybe 30% waste in this system. So we like to think almost space uh, ship you know or space station that we will have zero waste and also 100 percent reuse that's the long-term goal at least um even though we're not sure if we can achieve that but that's the plan so that we will take the waste remineralize it and put it back into the plant uh, the facility uh, so this is also one example of what it might look like uh, this demonstration unit that we want to build in our lab and uh, the short term goals with Unity for Water is to install two, three of these research models at the lab, perform some tests with different types of water from industry and sewage systems, and then invite politicians, students, industry and anyone else to uh, and use this research facility as a showcase. And also we are having discussions with our partners in Texas, in Wichita Falls. They are quite advanced in wastewater treatment. So we were thinking about maybe building something small scale, pilot scale there also to make use of their expertise and share that. And the long term goals, of course, with the project would be that these type of systems shouldn't be at our university. We would like them to be at the industrial sites or the municipality, municipality the schools, offices or food stores, so that we close the distance between the food production and the producer of the water and the nutrients, so that we'll, they will be much closer to each other. And maybe expand this technology on the international market and once and for all just bury the old idea that it's impossible to reclaim and reuse water from the society. And by doing that, we would like to contribute to maybe a shift in the policies and regulations and laws regarding this. 
So basically what we're doing now is we are installing Unity for Water at Maladon University, and then we might do a little test in Texas, and then hopefully we can do it at the industry. And we think that the market share for this will continue to grow because uh, the global market for water recycle and reuse technologies are growing and it's expected to grow uh, quite a lot. So we hope there will be a big interest in these areas. And this is the future vision that we will maybe have these food production plants very, very close to the industry so that we don't have the distance so we can directly make use of the water and excess heat and anything else that is produced in the industry directly to food production. And on the west, the, the left picture, that's a picture of a wastewater treatment plant that's actually in the middle of an agricultural field. So then we can uh, we really close the distance there. So we are directly using the wastewater after treatment, of course, as fertilization and irrigation of the crop. And then we do continue to do measurement with the drones technology and communicate the data back to the plan so that we can optimize the, the system. So that was very short from me. Super cool, super speedy, Monica. Of yes. course, this, uh, I mean, uh, has to also be an open invite uh, mm -hmm. for all of those who would like to join this uh, agricultural technological playground uh, to, to see how this can be expanded. I mean, there's room for lots of different testing here, how we can use technologies from other areas within this field. So mm -hmm. uh, for Water is just starting out, so we're really eager to get in more uh, stakeholders who are interested in participating in one way or the other, right? Yes. Yes, we are very interested in that in all aspects. And we are looking at it quite from an engineering side, as you can see, but we are also very interesting to add more like social aspects and consumer behavior and that part into the project. So. We should also say something that I think there is uh, more coming from Vinova when it comes to the food area and agriculture. So uh, if you're interested, let, let me uh, and or Monica know about this and we will see what we can do about that to, to add new activities to the project. Super, thanks a lot Monica. Thank you. Then we see if we can find uh, Sophie. Yeah. I am there, I'm sorry. Uh... <laughs> Super. Yeah. So we move over to electronics, right? Keep. Yes, uh, and I really doubt that I will use my 10 minutes, so let's see. Uh, this wants to collaborate. There was a problem displaying the content. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> but you remember. Well, we you see remember. you. That's marvelous. Yeah. The the first meeting ever of <laughs> Trace for Value. It was exactly for those like of that. you who who know us by now. We sort of take turns, me and Sophie, to have a little bit of technical problems sharing screens. Yeah, that. precisely. So normally I do that. So, so thanks, thanks for doing it today, Sophie. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to remove the, wait a minute, I have too many things open, probably. A great PowerPoint is, is uh, crashing. That's We see a very good part of this, so the, the presentation coming to life. Yes, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Let me just restart that. So, yeah, yeah, restart the program. I can, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I will fill in that. A, she's in beautiful Gothenburg. <laughs> Yeah, it's great today. So, uh, as Marlin said in Swedish earlier, the second part of the meeting today will be for our Trust for Value project, which is on policy and education. Uh, that part will be in Swedish. I, uh, we have decided that there was enough things around these topics in English already, and we decided to stick with Swedish because all the documentation we have is in Swedish as well. Uh, so this is... The second part will not be in English. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and I can also name that tomorrow there is. Uh, I can obviously not do both at the same time. Uh, here. Let's try this again. Does it work? Yes, perfect. Very good. Thank you. 
So uh, as Marlene introduced, I will talk about traceability, uh, traceability system for electrical and electronic product in a circular system. And basically what I'm pr uh, presenting today is like the trailer of tomorrow's longer meeting. <laughs> so we, we are finishing this key project at the end of March and uh, we will have then uh, a longer meeting, one and a half hour tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. And the first like eight minutes would be exactly what I'm presenting today. So this is like what the trailer is <laughs> it's, uh, to give you a, a taste of what tomorrow will be. I am leading this project, but I'm by no means doing this alone. We are a project management team, uh, and this is a collaboration, uh, collaborative work between Chamish and the City Technique, where I am working, and Boyd, which is a design uh, bureau that was part of our concern, but is now their own companies. We are 23 part in KEEP, and this is KEEP 3. I will come back to this. Uh, that the first one was not 22 partners, but now there is 23 partners across the full value chain. 19 in Sweden, one in Norway, one in UK, one in uh, Netherlands, and one in the US. So we are working in English, and we we are really working across the border. So it's very interesting. So this this journey started uh, roughly seven years ago. Uh, and those of you who have seen me present before, <laughs> you must be tired of these slides, I'm sorry. But it's important to understand where we are now and where we have landed to understand where the project is coming from. So seven years ago, there was this idea of like, let's make a traceability system. Uh, would, they, would this be uh, possible? What would be the use? And who? what kind of information would be useful for who basically in the value chain? And by traceability system, at that time, what was in the head of the people is basically you have a product which has a code on it. In that case, it's a QR code. You're using a scanner. In that case, it's a phone to scan the code and gives you access to a web page where you have information about the product. This is what is now called the digital product pass. Uh, but like seven years later, it's called like that. <laughs> and at that time, uh, basically, there was a lot of work on what would be the use for that. Uh, and they identified, we identified three uh, main circular goals. One would be to facilitate the material recycling because you know what's in the product. I, I, I didn't define what would be the product uh, information that is available, but in principle, it could be anything. It would facilitate the reuse because you would have the product history, so you're more comfortable, for example, to buy a secondhand product and it would allow a sustainable production. To this, now people are adding two things in general. The first one is to help people make sustainable decisions or more sustainable choices when they're buying something. And the second one is to help authorities uh, make sure that there is compliance <laughs> with the product. Uh, so that was Keep One. This is like a very short summary of what was done in Keep One. Of course, there's much more than this, and we have a web page where you can see that. In the phase two, the, the main outcome was a prototype that has been seen many times before, and it's to present basically information from many sources in one unified interface. For those who are in Sweden and are using Hemnet, it's exactly that, but like for product, magnify like a thousand times <laughs> or something. Uh, and in T3, the, uh, so a year and a half ago, roughly, we have made available the prototype on GitHub on a non-commercial license. So if you want to Frankenstein some sort of back end on our front end, you're very welcome to do that for research purposes. And that brings us to phase three, which is now what we're concluding basically next week and the um, concluding meeting is tomorrow. And in phase three, the focus has been on three different things. We have had a bunch of discussion around standards and regulation because <laughs> I never thought that this would come so fast, but it's really there. You need to follow what's happening and to understand that. Uh, there is pilot, and this is basically we have a real strength and keep that we have a lot of uh, companies along the full value chain. So we find groups of companies whose interests are aligned and want to work together, and they're testing things on a small scale. And use cases, which is very precise example of what the digital product pass will allow. 
And this has been also for many years under discussion, but it's uh, a new flavor in the sense we are checking what is available now and what very concretely having more information will allow us to do. And here I put like puzzle pieces because this is really how I'm seeing the, the traceability system or digital product pass. It's a very big puzzle with three different layers. You have basically what information would be available, how it will work, and the rules that will, uh, so the standard and regulation on how the thing, the pieces will move together. Uh, it's a um, it's a puzzle whose border are not known at the moment, and it's a bit fuzzy picture because not everyone has, <laughs> no one has understood exactly how everything will work together, and we are basically having a few puzzle pieces in our hands, and we are working to be part of the image at the end by doing very concrete things. So this is a bit how we've been doing keep, uh, and this is the trailer part of to, uh, that. That I'm telling you, like, please come to the meeting tomorrow. So tomorrow, this is what is on the menu. I will do a, uh, basically what I did today and talk a little bit more about regulation. But today, Willem will do this later. Uh, GS1, Sweden will talk about the use of international standard. Then we will have four of the pilot that that will show the the idea that they wanted to do and what uh, uh, learnings they have uh, along the way of testing things. And I will basically conclude after that. This is what's on the menu for tomorrow. And with that, I will leave the word for the next person. So that's Thank the you. teaser for today. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So do we have a lot of people who's, uh, who are interested in electronics or electronic uh, products in the audience? So. Uh, let Sophie know and uh, please join the meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Angelica we'll... posted the link for registering for Perfect. tomorrow's meeting. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then we uh, rapidly move on to Karin. Nice to see you again today. Thanks a lot for the meeting yesterday, Karin. Thanks it was so great. Much, Malin. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for participating. Yes. <clears throat> so I will also have parts of my presentation from yesterday. So Marlin, this will be. There are more of us in the meeting, so that will yeah. be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This will be a recap for you, but uh, news for some of you. Uh, so I will just try to share my screen and the right squeeze screen, which I didn't succeed to do. Okay. Then let's do it. We blame the team's link. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So can you see my screen now? Yeah, very good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I just have to apologize that I don't look at you because I look at my other screen. But yes. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Karin Vanneberg. I'm working at Rank Cells at our uh, R&D and strategy department, and I'm the project manager for this sub project called Digital Twins in Circular Value Networks. Um, so this is where we start. Waste is material without an identity. And this is something we are talking a lot about in my sub project that if we have information about something that we today call waste, this can be a resource. Not everything, some things need to be detoxified, for example, but we can use things as resources if we know what it is. Our sub project is therefore focusing on information and information sharing, of course, creating traceability in the value chain. And we uh, are focusing on the circular value network for flat glass in the construction industry. And what we want to do then is uh, to have a method to share data in a scalable way among the actors in the circular value network. And we also look at the business model for this. This means we want to develop ontologies that enable semantic interoperability, which makes it possible to share data between actors and computers within this circular value network. And an ontology is uh, basically an information model 
uh, in a specific context that makes it possible for these uh, actors and computers to understand what information and data we are sharing. We are seven partners in this project. It's Linköpings Universitet developing the ontology and looking at value creation in the value network. Parkeby Science uh, ranks cells. Uh, Luleå Teknisk Universitet, who's looking at the circular business model. White, the architectural firm. Sangoban, that is the producer of that class. And we also have the perspective of Isover, which is uh, they are producing glass wool. So it's a downgrade from the flat glass. I should also say that flat glass is what you have in windows today, and this is the highest quality of glass. And what is really, really good with flat glass is that you can recycle it how many times you want if you process it the right way and uh, don't get contamination. So uh, I will explain a little bit about this. Uh, process and the ecosystem. So we have a window in a facade. We have flat glass here. We then demolish the window and take out the flat glass in it. We produce something called collet in a window crushing station. This collet is then sent to an optical sorter where it's quality assured. We are then sending it to a manufacturer, in this case Angoban, who are mixing this collet in their production to produce new flat glass. Then they are processing this flat glass according to customer specifications, and then we have the flat glass from the recycled raw material in a new window. And what we have been doing previously in this project is to identify actors and activities in these different steps. And we also identified some very important parts Oh, sorry, um, of this value network where we have requirements. So we have requirements from the industry, in this case, Sangoban. Uh, we have the quality assurance that's really important if we are using whatever material we are using, but especially if we are using recycled raw material, it's very important we have the right quality of um, the raw material. A lot of important data that is needed to verify this is collected in an inventory or uh, are coming from a BIM model. But the information in the BIM model must be verified often by an inventory. So this is a very important step of the process for enabling flat glass recycling. And uh, during a workshop, we identified the most uh, important data data and information sharing um, sharings that needs to be done. So this is a bit of a simplified version, uh, but uh, what you see here is basically that you need to share data with other actors and you also need to do it with actors that you don't have anything to do with basically uh, in the normal uh, linear flow. And therefore we want to emphasize that if we are focusing on circular uh, material flows, we need a scalable way of sharing data between these actors in order to verify the quality, in order to verify these requirements from the industry with, for example, data from the inventory or from the process where we uh, are producing the new raw material. So therefore, <clears throat> we are looking to this ontology, the common language or the information model in this context. And our approach is that we use this ontology together with semantic interoperability that makes it possible for all these actors to share data, but they store the data on their own databases. And by using the semantic interoperability, we create a way to control how different actors can access this data. That's very important. It's not just like you get access to all the data in this value network by being an actor in it. The role you have in this circular value network sets the requirements from what data you are able to access.
So now we have been focusing a lot of the theory. Now we want to move on to next step. And therefore we are now planning to make a demonstration case. And uh, we want to move from theory to more practice and learn more about how we actually create traceability, both in the digital and the physical flow. Uh, so we will test this on a construction project. Uh, and um, I can take the chance to say that if you are sitting on the construction project where you're going to replace your windows or demolish your window or windows, please let me know. Maybe this can be an interesting thing for you to be part of and we can see if uh, your project is suitable for our demonstration. Uh, we will, of course, do an inventory. Uh, based on the requirements uh, or the data that we need to collect. And like I said, we want to verify the traceability both on the physical flow, but also for the digital flow and see that these ones are matching. And also, of course, look at the share in between actors, both between machines or computers and uh, people. And I would like to finish with some key insights so far. Um, we can't create circular material uh, material flows alone. This has been very, very obvious the more I work with it. Uh, we need to cooperate because we need all these different perspectives from the different parts of the value chain. Um, and the inventory is a very important step to collect all the data and to verify the data from the built environment that we need to enable this recycling. Yeah, Saint Gobain has now also started an inventory course uh, for those people uh, that should inventory the flat class in uh, in order to for them to do it the proper way because this is very important. The devil's in the details, and that's why we are now focusing on a demonstration case. We know that we will learn a lot when we um, focus on the reality and not only on you know, on our desktop. Um, and this infrastructure that we are building with the ontology has a great potential to enable other applications on top of it and how you present this data collected. Um, so we see a lot of potential for to collect data for reports, for example, sustainability reports or put it together as statistics for different stakeholders, depending on what they are focusing on. And uh, we also see that you could you could in the future use it together for collecting data for digital product passports. Uh, but of course, if you want an application or use the data from uh, the ontology structure, we need to uh, understand what perspectives and what purposes the data needs. So we also know that the right data is collected from this value network. Now we only looked at the data for flat glass recycling and enabling this process. Thank you very much. That was everything from me. Yeah. I think that it was super nice to be in that meeting yesterday with mm -hmm. people from, from four different countries. Uh, I think it was seven countries. Really. Yeah, seven countries. Yeah. Cool. Or nationalities. Uh, Sorry. Seven nationalities. Yeah, yeah. well, that's uh, so interesting to see how this is really a European or international uh, question and challenge. Uh, and that the companies in your network are really into solving this problem uh, mm -hmm. jointly in the in the ecosystem. I think that's uh, quite wonderful. And we were discussing what will be the disruption in this industry. It's quite interesting. Maybe you don't think about that when you go to sort your stuff on Saturday mornings, right? No. Uh, really we need to start brilliant. thinking about this. Yeah. <laughs> we will start thinking about that. We will educate, educate ourselves and the companies yeah. as well. We yeah. do understand that now. Thank you so much, Karin. And I guess you will also Thank have you. room for more people who would, if anyone would be interested to be involved in a demonstrating, uh, going very practical, that would also be an open invite, I hope. Yes. That's something that we look forward to get into during this year. Yes. Super. Thanks a lot, Karin. So then we'll move into something completely different. Jenny, are you in the meeting? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Thanks, Thanks Marlon. Marlon. Fashion and brand. Now we're going glamorous, right? Yes, indeed. Now we go into the 
fashion market and fashion industry. Um, I will share my screen. So we're going to talk about the digital product pass passport within textiles, which is a little bit related to um, to keep as uh, Sophie was outlining, but this is within uh, the fashion business. And and please um, scan the QR code. Uh, so what we have been doing, and I'm just going to do a short presentation as per today, because I'm then hand over to Evelina that will um, present a, a master thesis in this uh, topic. So, but just shortly what we have uh, been doing, and uh, the QR code will uh, turn up later in the presentation as well. Um, so, a timeline what's happening, and we are over here right now, but we started off um, about, what is it, 15 months ago uh, in, in the late 22, and uh, by a year, uh, uh, yes, one, one year ago, we delivered the first um, key deliverable, uh, which was the requirement analysis of what is this, uh, what should we do? And based on that, what, what was that based on? Well, that was based on, on uh, research within the uh, ESG um, uh, framework, which is uh, the European uh, Sustainability Initiatives for textile, and or not only for textile, but textiles is a part of that. Um, and by uh, May last year, we then concluded in a data protocol, and that is meaning what kind of attributes should be showcased uh, in this QR code, and what attributes are there to, to uh, understand for an end consumer what is the value of this and where has this uh, 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 garment uh, been. Then we continued over the summer. We built a consumer interface, the one that you've seen that when you scan the QR code. We designed technical architecture. Uh, and during a very, very short time period between October and December, we built a completely scalable uh, IT foundation for it, including infrastructure and APIs. Uh, that is then serving the consumer interface that you uh, see when you scan the code. Um, in parallel to that, Marimekko and Kapal, that was the two brands that is included in, in the pilot, they uh, gathered all the data um, for, in total, three different um, uh, uh, garments, um, two with Kapal and, and one with Marimekko. Um, and we uploaded all this data to the solution and went live in January, um, two months ago. So what we are doing now, we are, um, this, is, this is running on live data available for end consumers. And um, we will continue to run it for a couple of months uh, and, and gather analytics uh, of uh, what this has been uh, impacting in parallel that we are also following the involvement and maturity uh, of the regulation, because the regulation isn't 100% set in stone yet. So I will just then jump into, and this is what you can then, if you scan the QR code, this is the end result. And uh, what you can see now is that you have an instant um, pop-up of this web application, but what's happening in the background is that we are uh, sending APIs to what we call a resolver, which is kind of a library telling where to look for this data. And that the, the set of URLs, this one is, um, the one you see is based on one URL, the Capball, I'll turn the Capball versions is uh, providing two URLs to two different data sources where the data is populated and again, shared back to the, uh, to the web application and that is done in, in line with um, uh, regulation that all the data should be uh, distributed and be able to both uh, update but then also added to later on because first what we see today is production data and what we see later is also uh, circularity data related to uh, in case we have a, a repair studio or we have a resell or we have recycling. So what's interesting here, finally, before I leave, is just to 
all of these garments, it's about 3,000 garments, have a unique QR code. So this QR code is not the same for anyone. And the reason for doing that way is because when we move into the circularity piece, then uh, it's important that you can get information and upload information for this unique uh, garment uh, to see what's happening uh, to exactly this one. That was uh, a quick one. There's a quick um, for you in the chat, Jenny. Yeah, OK. Uh, Where let is me data see. stored? Uh, so for the Campbell solution, it's two uh, different sources. Uh, we have built one like a data storage. So we upload the data there and then we uh, gather that data via or um, get that data via API. And uh, the other source is uh, the trust trace uh, traceability solution, which also where Couple was tracing their data from suppliers. Um, and then we have an API between sort of, it is two trust trace solutions, but it's still two technical uh, separated platform. What we will discuss with Couple uh, the coming uh, month is if we also uh, build the, the API is there, but if they will build on their site uh, to serve that API with data directly from their uh, PLM system. So now, as you say, it's not a capital for the moment, and the reason for that is that we so far in the pilot haven't had time to build that API or to not to build the API, but to actually adjust for on capital side. Uh, to, to uh, source that API. But uh, from a technical point of view, API is there, so it's uh, it can be sourced from everywhere. Um, well, I think there think... we have to leave it. If, if Jenny, yes. you can keep better track of the chat, since we're on a such a tight schedule today with lots of interesting speakers. Yes, I know. Thank you. Hey. And maybe you can also have a conversation separately if if you want to have uh, more talks about uh, what is stored, what and where, and the business models around this, I guess, can be interesting as well. Yeni, would you like to I'd introduce like to... Uh, Evelina? Yes, Evelina. Um, she's been, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to do that. So Evelina has been working in parallel to this pilot with her master thesis uh, and then investigating more. So what does this mean for the brands? What's that digital product passport means for the brands within the fashion industry? And then I think I hand over to Evelina to, to uh, do a, a more deep dive introduction to her work. Yeah, let's do that. Great. Thanks, Jenny, for the introduction. And I'll also share my screen. Um, Let's see if this one works. Yeah. Right. OK. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I'm Evelina Lehtisalo and I'm a Aalto University graduate from Creative Sustainability Program. And I'm actually currently working in Sweden, Stockholm, within sustainability in fashion. And today the focus is even, uh, in my presentation and I will present my <laughs> master's thesis on the opportunities and challenges for uh, of the DPP for textile and fashion companies. And as Jenny said, I conducted this thesis for Trust Trace as a part of the, this Trace for Value DPP in textile subproject. But yeah, let's jump into it. Um, and here's just shortly my agenda for today, uh, where I'm just going to give you some uh, short intro and background to my study and then uh, going into some study specifics and then discussing my findings and finally concluding the topic and giving some practical tips for companies. But yeah. So what is a digital product passport? Yeah, there might be still some people who don't know uh, who doesn't know what is DPP. So DPP is a digital record that includes data on the entire lifespan of a physical product. And these physical products can be scanned by consumers or any other stakeholders in the value chain to access product information and services. And now European Union is introducing this uh, digital product passport for certain products, product groups and textiles uh, is one of these product groups. 
and these are introduced uh, through the ESP or Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation. And the DPP related rules are expected uh, expected to enter into force by 2027, but this is still to be confirmed. Uh, and the ex uh, and the regulation is actually uh, being adopted uh, maybe this April. But let's see about that. But I think that's possible. So uh, amongst uh, many other objectives this EU DPP has, the main objective is anyways to simplify digital access to product information on sustainability, circularity and uh, legal compliance. And uh, this information could be anything related to durability, recycled content, recyclability or, for example, environmental footprint, uh, such as greenhouse gas emissions. And um, it is very good to know that, that this DPP is not a track and tracing tool itself, but it still allows including some traceability information if needed and wanted. And uh, this DPP system will then be built on existing best practices at international level, but it will also utilize some uh, new technologies and approaches uh, if possible. For example, it's now planned to be built on decentralized system architecture. So how uh, DPPs became relevant for textile and fashion industry then? Uh, that's a good question, but uh, it all started from environmental and social sustainability challenges. And these were spiced up with the increasing uh, importance of CSR initiatives and the complexity of the industry supply chains. And all of these uh, have contributed to the demand of uh, demand for enhanced traceability and transparency of products and supply chains in the industry. However, uh, companies find it very hard still uh, providing traceability and transparency of their products and supply chains, as there is a lot of incorrect data or no data at all in the industry uh, in some cases, and there is also a lack of adequate regulation uh, and laws. So this is where kind of the European Union now has jumped in and uh, proposes this DPP for textile and fashion industry enterprises. But uh, as the implications of the DPP are very unclear still, uh, I got the chance to study this, uh, study the opportunities and challenges of the concept uh, alongside the Trace Fair Value project. And my study included eight case companies from the Nordics, uh, and I interviewed all of these eight case companies. And then I also got to, ma uh, got to make observations in the Trace for Value DPP in textile project meetings, uh, which also involved two of the case companies that I had interviewed. And of course, I went uh, through multiple publications related to the topic, as you do for theses. But yeah, uh, when we talk about the opportunities that the case companies identified, uh, they were somewhat similar to each other, but then there were also some differences in some expectations. And uh, first of all, all case companies believe that the increased data and traceability companies would need uh, would need to provide through the DPP would enable them to uh, exercise enhanced traceability and also efficiency uh, regarding data management, for example. Secondly, uh, most case companies believe that the enhanced data utilization would allow them to first better stand out from other companies. Secondly, uh, better compare their businesses and products to other companies. And thirdly, to better develop their own product portfolios when they get more data to analyze their product base as well. And uh, thirdly, uh, from consumer point of view, uh, most case, case companies um, believe that the DPP would create value for consumers uh, through the increased availability of the information at the point of purchase, but uh, the DPP was also seen as a tool to guide consumers uh, to make more sustainable purchases. And on top of this, some case companies find that 
the increased control and collaboration uh, through the DPP would enable them to uh, do more efficient supply chain management, uh, which would help them to lo locate risks in the riskiest areas of their supply chains. And then lastly, uh, many, many of the case companies also felt that um, the DPP would enable them to utilize circular solutions and business models in an easier way. For example, when they get access to data uh, at the point of free sale and uh, recycling. But yeah, um, oh, oops. Um, before we are uh, totally happy with the concept, the case companies actually did identify a lot of challenges we have to overcome before uh, we can implement the DPP or start working with it perfectly. <laughs> uh, and one of the most pressing challenge was actually the current complexity of the supply chains in the industry because it's very hard to achieve full traceability and reliable data. For example, uh, in this case, the case companies felt like that how it would be, or they questioned how it would be possible then to verify the data that they would get from their supply chain. And this was especially emphasized by larger companies with larger or uh, with longer supply chains. And uh, moving forward, uh, case companies were also concerned about monetary resources and technical capabilities in their supply chain. Uh, as this would complicate a lot the day-to-day -day data management and the te technological implementation of the DPP. And this was emphasized uh, by SMEs with less resources. And uh, then thirdly, uh, some case companies were also concerned about the attractiveness of the DPP to its users as it's not fully clear yet uh, what kind of benefits it will uh, create for each users in the value chain, uh, even though it's a good uh, solution at an ideal level. And uh, when it comes to the mandatory information requirements of the uh, DPP, uh, they are also causing concerns as some environmental data is very hard to quantify and verify and uh, the current mandatory requirements do exclude social sustainability requirements, uh, which is also seen as a problem by the case companies. Uh, but how, uh, anyways, they emphasize, all of them emphasize that uh, it is a good start to start with environmental information uh, as it would be a lot otherwise. And finally, the case companies were worried about the industry's readiness to implement the DPP by 2027. And uh, some of them were actually a bit suspicious how this DPP will advance the industry's sustainability at the end of the day. Uh, but before I'm stopping, I still want to say something. So uh, now that we have looked at the concept a bit more and we had recognized some opportunities and challenges. Uh, so how should companies move forward then? What are the things on their to-do lists next? So I think definitely they should affect the mandatory uh, information requirements still when they can and then uh, start implementing the DPP by taking a step-by-step -step approach which would include, for example, assessing the legislation and then defining the in individual company needs. Um, this would, of course, um, uh, need involvement from all relevant stakeholders and companies should check their own uh, data maturity, broader business goals and the sourcing model and other important things at this point. And then it would be create, uh, great to create the work plan and then, of course, uh, acquire the necessary resources uh, needed for the DPP. And it's always to, uh, good to start with the smaller scope. So pilot, pilot, pilot is the key. And uh, yeah, as my last words, uh, I want to say that even though we don't know the final information requirements for the DPP yet, we still know that it's not going to be a track and trace tool. We need something else for that. Um, 
and uh, the DPP will be just one piece of a puzzle of uh, the company's sustainability work in the industries that it affects. Yeah, thank you. And Very nice. The, thank you so much, Evelina. Yeah, and if you have any questions, you can drop them to me. <laughs> but I don't know how much time we have because we are one minute over of my time. So we'll, we'll try to, yeah. to keep on the schedule here. But of course, the chat is open for you as well. And yeah. I really can just post uh, the, the link to your report to your yeah. thesis. So yeah. that we can continue Great. the discussion there, but it open, and I guess we can find you here and there if somebody wants to reach out. And you, I mean, yeah. post your email yeah. address if you want to, Evelyn, uh, yeah. uh, so that people can reach I'll out. I'll drop you. my work email address. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. More pilots, and then we'll hear from from our guest speakers today. That's Carolina. Yes. Talk about product passwords for furniture, right? Right, and I'm happy I can start three minutes uh, before the scheduled time because I have uh, <laughs> twice as many slides as the wow. time. Wow. But but we have a lot of pictures, so so I will scroll fast through that. Thank well, you. Let me share my speedy education. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me share the screen, and full uh, presentation mode will make sense. Just a second. Can you see the screen? Perfect. Thank All you. All right. So my name is Karolina Kazmierczak and I work uh, at the Circular Economy Group, uh, Szalmes Industry Technique. And um, initially I wasn't a project leader for this project, but my colleague went on uh, uh, parental leave and I took over uh, fall last year. But the project is going to the end, so let me flip the pages. So the project, it's a lot of information, don't worry about this. The project started November 21 and we got a prolongation actually. So we are going until the end of April this year. We had, maybe some of you were there, I don't know, but we had a final seminar, what is it now, two weeks ago, I believe. Um, but the final report is, is being worked on, so that's left. And the goal with the project uh, is pretty much how to, to how to uh, handle or how to increase the traceability of furniture. So we gathered um, quite many, uh, what is it, 16 uh, organizations, companies from the furniture industry in Sweden. Um, and we had a reference group as well. You can see eight, eight uh, organizations there. And the aim was really to, to facilitate the future implementation of digital product passport and how can we create more value with the data that will be shared in the future. Um, financers Vinova and Vestrajo Talent uh, Regionen. Um, so uh, briefly, <laughs> briefly through the, the setup of the work. So we, we had uh, it, it. Well, the work was organized in kind of three work packages. The first work package focused really on, on understanding the needs, you know, mapping information needs, risks, opportunities with all the partners uh, to get kind of common understanding of what are the driving forces of, of different actors. Then work package two focus more on information points, I would say. It's written information sharing standard, but we didn't establish any standards really, but laying more like a foundation for information sharing standard and also developing prototypes, but not the solutions. It was prototypes really for the sake of testing uh, in the project. Uh, what my upcoming product passport uh, really mean for, for the industry? And the last work package, I have to just move my little window here where I see Malin. <laughs> uh, the last work package was more theoretic, I would say, really exploring, exploring what may come in the future regarding business models, business ecosystem, system effects and such. Um, so based on those work packages, we try to sort of prioritize, we call it situations. I mean, this is a translation from Swedish as well, so you have to apologize if it doesn't make too much sense. And I see already on the picture that I didn't translate everything, but pretty much we we narrowed it down to three areas. Circular design production, sustainable purchase decisions, and how to prolong life of furniture. And you can see like different, um, the, the, the wheel with the different actors from the uh, value chain. I will translate it before I can share maybe this presentation. Um, and different, what points really fall under each of those uh, situations. So if we look at the first one, which is circular design production, um, 
I can go here right, right away. So three of our uh, project partners were used. Their furniture was really used the, as the examples uh, in order to work uh, close to reality. So we did all the work in this uh, pretty much work package. We focus on those three pieces of furniture and and information points. So we try to really um, discuss and, and see what what points may come in a future product passport. Uh, what may be required, you know, what would make sense, what will be easy to share, and so on and so on. Uh, one thing about those those producers, they are already quite, um, what should I say, um, they, they have experience with like uh, digitalization and, you know, providing information because they are certified according to Mobile Facta. I don't know if there's any English translation of that, but also like Svanen, which is the eco label, the Swedish eco label. So they they know already they have a certain level of maturity when it comes to like data sharing and you know what to report and so on um so maybe it's a bit of bias what i'm saying uh then what we did uh, a lot of information here and i don't <laughs> i don't expect you will read all this but this is like the original list of points information points or data points that we tested on those three producers and then we did kind of a gap analysis um where where pretty much what turned out is a lot of information they provide today, but where is the gap? It's those more circular aspects or information points regarding circularity. And one key aspect that was really identified as particularly interesting was repairability. And now I will just scroll quickly. Uh, those were the categories and, you know, you will have the presentation. So those were the categories. We looked at repairability um, and pretty much that's it. I think we we defined also under categories. What do, do we mean, for example, by AIDS or dis disassemblability and so on? But I jump to the next situation and that's those decisions to make um, a sustainable kind of sustainable choices, I would say, when buying furniture. And I think I can right away open those three. So that's that's not the app. That's not the final solution. But but that would be what we think would help people to make those purchase decisions. So you scan a furniture and then you know more information, you know, what data is there and, and what's the carbon footprint, for example, of this chair and so on. So that the, the customers can make better decisions, more sustainable decisions. And also regarding this, we, you know, the, the, the information may be like if you have an ad somewhere, uh, I don't know, like Amazon or whatever, ads for sale also have this information so that we can really enable few loops of, of circulating that, that piece of furniture. And I'll jump to the next situation, which was this prolongation. How can, you know, a digital passport enable um, to, to different actors to extend life of furniture? Um, and we identified some barriers. Why, why it's not already the case today? So first of all, it's cheaper to buy new. That's the case. That's the reality. You know, competence to repair. Okay, there are some people, but maybe it's not enough. Uh, the same with logistics. It costs a lot to move the furniture, to store the furniture. That might be quite expensive. And, and labor costs to handle the furniture, to, to repair it, and so on. So there is few barriers to do that. But we are thinking, OK, how can we support to assess the fate, so to say, of a piece of furniture, but also provide more and more qualitative repairs? That's very important. Those repairs are really crucial. And here it's again some information. OK, uh, repair guides, you know, how, how, how can I assess what's the status of this furniture, this piece of furniture? What about its repairability? Um, also, amateurs and certified partners, there is certified companies for some of the producers who can re make like professionally repairs, but there's amateurs as well. So all those people would need more, more information. Um, another thing we discovered or we came out as a result, pretty much user friendly information is the key. And here you have these energy labels, you know, how can we provide it? that it's really user friendly. Maybe the EU will not require it, but it will really help people to, to make better decisions as well. And I think there is oh, there is something from Sheenarps, what they have, you know, that, that we tested also with Sheenarps, our solutions. 
And maybe last on this, it's uh, from the user test, what it, we identified also this exploded view. Assembly instructions, maybe some videos would help, you know, step-by-step um, -step instructions, how can I repair, how can I fix it, and so on. And I just run quickly, I think I'll skip this, but no, actually this one is quite important. Add data on individual item level. We identified that marking a batch, it's not enough. It will have to be on individual level and upstreams and downstreams information sharing. And I think I'll skip the spare parts. Also, spare parts are very uh, important, but I'll come to this at the last slide. So work package, package three, briefly, that's the one which is very theoretic, very looking into the future. Um, business information system, you know, what are the possible business models, changes and effects on different actors within the value chain. And as a summary, I'm I'm running really fast. I, I noticed that. I can take it easy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You have so, until 1420, so you have all the time in the oh, world. 20. All right. Yeah. Oh, okay. It'd be cool. Oh my God. Yeah. True. But but anyway, recommendations. And I think here are some key key ideas. So based on this more like exploratory way of looking into the future. Um, it's really regarding partners. Of course, your partners within the value chain are the key. And I think someone mentioned earlier, you know, you need to pair it together with, with people who have the same kind of understanding and, and needs and explore which partners can help you reduce the burden or really maximize the opportunities. Um, then when it comes to requirements, we I think in this work package, in the last work package, we discussed a lot about like inventory, you know, so sometimes people don't even know what they have. So inventory will be also the key. What furniture we have here that we can actually prolong the life cycle, uh, the, the lifetime. But also inventory upcoming requirements and uh, yeah, sort of identifying is this a challenge or opportunity or are there any risks or, or whatever. Um, data competence. So we also identified this point as maybe new competence competences will be needed on the market, you know, maybe new actors will be needed. Um, can we have domestic competence around the data? Um, but but it's also one thing is those digital product passports, you need some level of knowledge on this digitalization, so to say. Um, and someone I, I think mentioned, was it you, Sophie, regarding Hemnet, we also looked maybe like Hemnet in Sweden, you know, this this will be also a collection, like a marketplace kind of for all the furniture. We don't know, but that's that's just sort of looking into those future options. Um, also, people need to realize that future investments in IT systems will be needed, and that will be probably based on this future legislation. You know, can we have open standards, open databases, um, and so on? Um, and regarding the summary from the first part of those, uh, from the project, so the first kind of work packages, so we can say that those information points uh, that we at least looked into, you know, technically you can say you can take this list if someone needs and work on it already. You know, start kind of playing with that because most probably 90% will be required in a digital product passport uh, on the furniture or even other uh, product categories. But they will also make like people to make better choices, decisions based on, and we put like index because we never set and set up an index, but you know, repairability, CO2 footprint, certification. So, so people will make more information-based choices, pretty much. Add product-specific data downstream to enable circulation in few loops, that's identified, but also information at this individual level. So not the batch of products, but every single product. Um, assessment information about spare parts is an important part of extending the life of furniture. We need to be able to judge the status or assess the status of, of the piece of furniture and so on, but also provide information about spare parts, which are the key. And great opportunities to extend the life of more furniture with help of digital product export. And, and that's one, I would say, maybe not rocket science, but one conclusion from the project may be that people, most of the actors in the value chain, you know, they see it as an opportunity. They don't see it as a super burden in the future or a risk, which is good. 
And the last slide, what's happening now, <laughs> besides the fact that we are working on the final report, um, we ask this question, you know, what questions remain to our partners at the final uh, webinar or seminar? Um, we are still working on the summary and so on, but, but for sure more work is needed. And we see as well here, um, like related projects, we, we already identified those that are sort of ongoing. We have one even bigger, at least from, from Shanbash Industry Technique, we got into EU application of, on circular flows of furniture and digital product passport. So it's growing and it's not only a Swedish thing, it's, it's really the, the European um, need. And there's other projects uh, related to the topic. And I think that's, uh, yeah, thank you. That was the, the research team only because we prepared the document, but those are the guys behind it. Um, and now I see I made it. So I didn't have to rush so much, but I, I believe the information I can share. So, uh, you know, whoever needs to catch up and ask more, uh, don't hesitate to, to contact for sure. It would be yeah. super if you would share your presentation with me also, mm -hmm. since I'm mm -hmm. at, uh, on a sort of constant tour discussing uh, what we do in, in the traditional value product, but also in our sort yeah. of in our sister project. So it would be great to be able to include that as well. Now, it would be also great if sure. we could um, uh, promote your stuff a bit on the traditional value website, I think. Uh, All right. So we're trying to, we can discuss it separately, uh, just to uh, yeah. collect uh, all related projects a bit for, for those who are new to the topic uh, mm. to uh, one sort of landing page to learn more about this. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we recognize Thank you. you famous people from that uh, team picture. So <laughs> we do look forward to continued collaboration. There's Absolutely. still so much to learn in between, I think, here and all the different materials which are coming together in furniture mm. is uh, quite mm. exciting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here today, Carolina. Thank you. Please stay tuned. Um, yes. That's where we go to um, uh, another colleague at uh, Shadows Industry Technique, right? Yes. Mila, ESPR yes. and regulations. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Molly. I'm just looking into how to share my screen here, actually. Um, yeah, that's the first challenge. Wow. Uh, let's see here. Do you see my screen now? We do, yes. Thank you. Perfect. Great. Presentation mode. Excellent. All right. So I'm Vilhelm from Chalmers Industry Technique. And together with Sophie, we are working on a different working package in Trace for Value about data sharing and taking care of the circularity data. And uh, a great and a natural sort of place to start is, of course, the ESPR regulation and investigating that. But in this brief uh, update, I would like to argue and make the argument that it will probably also be the case that these new data-driven organizations that we see emerging here will be meeting other data regulation, which will of course become very interesting. And um, let's see here. Uh, so I mean, you know, the usual story is that ESPR could really turn out great, and I think it will. Um, because it's an EU regulation, it's much more top-down compared to what has been in place before. Um, it will affect a majority or almost all products on the internal EU market, enabling a critical enabler of circular economy, affecting climate envir uh, and the environment, empower the users, restrict companies where, I mean, they don't do it by themselves in the market, uh, they need to get a much better idea of their supply chains. But all of this will, of course, not come without challenges. And uh, I think it boils down to that there are two types of requirements in the ESPR PR regulation. First, we have the sort of performance requirements, which is a matter of designing the product from the start. And then we have the main sort of um, aspect here today, which is related to the information requirements and the DPPs that uh, previous speakers already spoke about. So, I mean, a brief recap here is that, well, product design is, of course, about designing the product at an early stage, uh, thus enabling uh, many things such as recycling, minimizing energy impact, uh, et cetera, et cetera. While the digital product passport should be much more of a sort of an 
online uh, document describing uh, what happens to a unique individual products throughout the uh, sort of life cycle. And here we see that, well, the idea is, of course, to develop a new, new part of the circular economy uh, based on a lot of sustainability data uh, throughout the life cycle. We have these physical data carriers. It, it's all going to be a decentralized system, so we need to share and transmit data ac across different actors, and we need to do data co collection on a very detailed level. And I mean, from a user perspective, when you see the QR code, that of course, um, it will hopefully be a great user perspective experience. Uh, but the infrastructure that needs to be up and running behind this will, of course, uh, lead to new demands on both collecting, processing, storing, and sharing the data. And so part of this slide is in, is in Swedish, uh, uh, but you, you will still get the main idea. So, I mean, it used to be simpler to work with data. Uh, it used to be the case that you had to think about a few different regulations, about corporate secrets, about the various norms out there, uh, the sort of non-legal non regulations from the uh, sort of Swedish uh, agencies, uh, the different agreements that you have with parties uh, producing your uh, uh, products. Um, and you also used to have uh, a few cases of legislation uh, besides the corporate secrets regulating what which type, type of data you're permitted to collect, patents, uh, and various types of IP law. Uh, you can come up with more examples. But what we have seen happen during, during the last decade or so, and what we see happening in the coming years, well, we see this new body of legislations emerging on the EU level. And of course, the ESPR here that is still emerging is highlighted in red. But we also see a number of other legislations about data. And in the coming years, I mean, several of these are already in place. Uh, some of these were are in have only been in, in effect for a year or so. But we, for instance, the AI Act uh, is coming into effect. The GDPR has been in, in effect for a while. We have cybersecurity demands. We have demands for open data uh, for large scale marketplaces, for instance. And we have a number of regulatory sort of um, developments on the EU level. And these companies that need to handle the data on a large scale, they will of course be, I mean, they will be finding themselves in a new regulatory landscape, starting out with ESPR as the core component, but it's possible that some of this data will also make other parts uh, relevant. And that's what we are exploring here. So the overall timeline um, is, well, it's not in force yet. Uh, the basis, I'll try to be brief here in the interest of time. The basis is the EU Green Deal. Two years ago, the EU Commission proposed the ESPR. Now we had a sort of trilogue uh, and a political agreement from the December last year. And this spring, we hope that this will, the, the ESPR will be formally adopted. And then we have the, the, a lot of power with the EU Commission and expert groups, and they have two or three years uh, setting out the regulations from the different domains. Uh, because, I mean, the regulation, it uh, empowers uh, the EU Commission to, um, to create so-called delegated acts. And we already know the priority products where these things will come up first. So I think it was highly relevant to speak about furniture and textiles today, but we also know that these things come in to other domains, such as electronics. So we see this uh, regulation coming into force in a few years. And of course, you already, already know uh, that there will be a lot of data, a lot of data in the DPPs. Uh, and the key here is what I've highlighted in red. I mean, we know that we will, the DPPs will have all this data, but I mean, having all that data will also make it possible to analyze it then and profit from it. And that's the sort of key, key insight here that you need to have, is that one, once you want to make use of this data for large scale purposes, such as for instance, using AI algorithms, 
to analyze your supply chains and how to optimize uh, and reduce uh, uh, energy uh, and resource use from the, your supply chains, for instance, you might need to think about the AI Act. If you have a large scale marketplace for circularity, you might need to think about the Digital Services Act. Uh, you, GDPR might become relevant and the Data Act might become relevant for documentation. So uh, what we know here is that the ESPR is definitely on, on its way. It's going to come into effect in the coming few years, uh, but it will, as a side effect, if you want to use that data uh, for circularity purposes and otherwise, uh, there will also probably be other re regulations that come into force that are relevant for firms and organizations. So we are starting to investigate uh, what these connections might be and how organizations could prepare to think also about other regulations. Uh, live, I mean, sort of organizing your firm to be compliant with the emerging regulations and setting up new roles and uh, processes in the organization. That will probably be a big thing in the circularity com community in the coming years. Uh, all right, uh, thank you. I'll try to be brief. Uh, if you have any com questions or comments, we have a minute or otherwise feel free to contact us here. Uh, and this is my email address. It's not easy to present uh, complicated matters in a very short time, yeah. but we do hope uh, that you guys in the audience uh, can follow. And I do think that we see uh, common challenges uh, between those different sub projects and the presentations. So uh, feel very free to reach out. Here's a question for you in the chat. Yes. OK, let me just read it here. How would the DPP, the ESPR and DPP as a data to, oh, well, let's see, the data to, uh, Sounds like a very long answer, actually. Oh, yes. I mean, uh, well, I mean, uh, these things, uh, first, I mean, the DPP will also be valid for all the products that, that uh, non-EU uh, country firms want to put on the EU market. So, I mean, it will clearly be relevant even if the product is uh, originally produced or partially produced elsewhere. And then one of the sort of, uh, well, easy ways to see is that the EU puts a lot of regulation on data sharing across uh, uh, boundaries. So, for instance, a, a GDPR regulation uh, could make, uh, I mean, unique tracking identifiers for, for products on your backpack, for instance, it could regulate to which countries you're permitted to share that data. Uh, so if someone buys a backpack in Sweden and travels to somewhere outside the, of the EU, it could become tricky in a sort of regulatory sense. It could also be, become tricky to store the data outside of the EU. And uh, well, I mean, you can unpack that box a lot. I will stop there. But uh, but it, it 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 I mean it it um, there will be such issues to think about and think about how to solve. Super, thank you so much, Dylan, for that presentation, uh, and we hope to be able to share that as well. Can I want to?